the best bits of news I ever got was about 10 years ago when somebody said to me, you're an asshole. I was like, oh, my gosh, <laughs> it's me. <Yeah. laughs> you know? Like, I know I get some. All right, guys, welcome back to Growth Minds. Today, we've got a special guest here today, Gary John Bishop. Thank you. Thanks for coming on, making yeah. all the way down here from Orlando, right? Yeah, I'm delighted to be here in your salubrious surroundings. It's pretty yeah. great in here. It's been a bit of a crazy, hectic day, so thanks for making it super flexible for yeah. us. Yeah, you're welcome. So you've just been blowing up in the uh, in the past past a couple of years, I guess. Well, yeah. I, think, I think I've heard about you through... Um, through an article, a series of articles that you wrote, but obviously you've got a series of books that you've been yeah. you've been working on. Um, but congratulations on all the success that you've been having. Yeah. What, what's it been like? It's it's weird. It's just weird. Is, is yeah, it? Because I was doing this before. You know, my my whole life's about making a difference for people. So we're just talking about how you're making music, right, and right. you you did it for just for the passion and right. the art. You know. So so you know, like I've been somebody who's been developing and coaching and 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 exploring growth with people. And I did that when I made no money doing it. Mm. So then getting paid to do it just seems weird. It's just strange. Was I mean, that, it's fine, but you know. Sure, yeah. yeah. It's weird. Was that just like a weird shift for you? Knowing, because sometimes when people do it for free, yeah. first time you charge someone to do it, yeah. there's like this weird shift in your mind. Do you, <clears throat> um, do you have that sensation? I, 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 there was a point where I just couldn't make it work any longer. I couldn't make not getting paid to do it working because there was such a demand on me. There was sure. so, so, so many people wanted to work with me. So, you know, it was a kind of natural thing at some point. Um, but it was, it was definitely strange to call it a business, mm. you know, cause it's really, I mean, I'll, I call it a business, but it doesn't occur to me like a business. I right. don't run it like a business. I don't run it like, oh, it. this and that uh, and, you know, yeah. Much to my wife's annoyance. Yeah, yeah. Is she, is she, she's kind of the, <laughs> she's much the financial more like, keeper in the what house. What are you spending on? I'm like, I don't. I'm just doing what I do, and it really gotcha. is like that for me. I don't. I mean, I, I've got a lot of collaborations, you know, obviously with my publishers and you know agents and different things that I do. Yeah. And you know, I'm very upfront about it. If you're not out to make a difference with people, like really make a difference, I won't work with you. Mm. If you're out to make money out of this. If that's what's guiding you, we won't do it. Gotcha. Gotcha. I don't, I don't mind people make money. I'm okay with making money too. Money's fine, but it's, it's it, it occurs to me as kind of like a kind of waste of a life. Gotcha. To gotcha. To just that's all I'm doing. Gotcha. I'm just gonna put that mic right yeah. in front of you. Well, I, I think I think the I think your your message is really inspiring, and and it's it's almost like this no BS anti secret. Yeah, straight to your face kind of message that I think is so refreshing for people to hear. Just given how, I think a lot of people that are millennials today, they're kind of grown up in like the infomercial days right. with the with the Tony <clears throat> Robbins and the Secret. That you can do this if you just put your mind to it. Yeah, and while it has, certainly has helped a lot of people, I think your message is just so different right. and, and unique. Yeah. So sometimes um, people think. <clears throat> A lot of sometimes people think that what I'm saying is just kind of what's on my mind or something. I mean, there's a lot of really well thought out, not by me, by other people, like philosophy, some of the world's greatest philosophers. I, I, I rely on them for the insight. Sure. Um, because there's been a, amazing things written about what it is to be a human being, you know. And I really feel as if it's my job to kind of get people to see the relevance of that in their lives. Like, mm. oh, that's really, well, that what that person wrote 100 years ago or 200 years ago or 500 years ago, it still resonates with what it is to be a human being. So, um, and yeah, but, I, but I'm committed, I'm absolutely committed that everybody have access to personal growth work, even those that typically wouldn't go towards that because they think yeah. it might be a bit, as I like to call it, just voodoo. Because there is a lot of voodoo. There's a lot of There's like, a lot of you shit know, out there. oh, for the love oh, of God. Yeah. And then, you know, sometimes you're listening to it. I'm like, it's it's too opaque. It's too conceptual. I, yeah. I want people to tell me on my terms. You know, I want people to talk to me in my language. I don't want to have to remember an acronyms or something. I don't want to 
you know, I don't want all that. I don't want three steps to happiness or something. You know what I mean? Like these three steps are going to change your life forever. Well, partly because I'm convinced two of those steps are a decent martini and a slice of pizza. So you can't. What's the third one? You know, yeah, yeah. like uh, yeah, if you yeah. eat well and have a, de- you know, like you're usually pretty happy. Yeah. So um, well, I want people to kind of point me in the direction of things where I can discover things for myself. But in my language, mm. um, and I really see that, I think most people want it that way. I think people want, uh, one of the best bits of news I ever got was about 10 years ago when somebody said to me, you're an asshole. I was like, oh, my gosh, <laughs> it's me. <Yeah. laughs> you know? Like, now I get something to go to work on, you know. Yes, sir. Up until that point, it was all this big mystery about am I psychologically doing something I shouldn't be doing or is it other people or is it maybe there's some deep-seated pattern. Mm. No, it's like, you know, you're a jerk. Stop doing that. Gotcha. You know, and it was, it was that kind of language, that kind of approach to life. It, it just inspires me and apparently inspires quite a lot of other people too. Who was that? Just like a drunk guy at a bar or something? No, or? <laughs> I, I got any personal growth work yeah. um, about 12, 13, uh, 13 years ago now. Uh, through a relative of mine, you know, they had suggested I do a workshop. Mm. Which the idea that just, you know, had my eyeballs rolling in my head. I just, sure. The idea of doing a workshop to me 13 years ago was just absurd. Yeah. But I did it. And uh, it wasn't what I expected. I, was, I really thought it was like, going to be what I thought personal growth work was, which was just a little too flimsy for my liking, you know? I, I, and it wasn't. It was eye-opening. It was revealing. And it was about me. It wasn't about how I can handle other people. It was more like, how can I handle myself? Mm. And that was radical because it, it was the first time in my life, I feel as if I made sense to myself. I had never made sense to myself. I could explain myself, but I really made it made sense suddenly. And then that started me on my pathway to trying to understand it and sure. share it with other people and dig in and find out more about the philosophy. And and here we are. Yeah, I mean, I, I I'm always curious to hear about kind of the origins of what dr- what drives someone like yourself. Yeah, that has now helped you know hundreds of thousands of people around yeah. this. Because to be able to get to, to this point and to have this level of clarity in your message yeah. and what you're delivering to people and, and to have the conviction to, to be able to really help people like this, it takes a lot of self-work. Unbelievable. And to be able to get to a certain struggle to, to overcome that, I'd love to kind of hear a little bit more about your I, journey. I, I would say um, there, were about, there was about six years of my life where I, you know, I, I, it was like the equivalent of Navy SEAL training on my brain. I mean, it was intense. I, like, I, I took myself all the way down to nothing. You said six years ago? No, there was about six years long. Oh, six years long. Right. I mean, I, Oof, I, wow. I did like some really very intense work on myself. And it was, it was a time of like so much uncertainty, but, but I was hungry to kind of be able to live in a way that wasn't shaped by who I had been to that point in my life. I was interested in how do you play with what it is to be a human being? How, how do you go beyond how you've turned out mm. other than just another version of it? I now the kind of human being, this human being is sitting here in front of you. This is a, this is a different human being. Like I, I could never have imagined this life yeah. ever have imagined it. And yet you have to like, really, you have to, I mean, there's my, workbook is called do the work and you have to do the work you have to understand yourself you have to see it you have to be able to see it doing its thing like what it wants to do that is your persona or your ego whatever you want to call it it's very specific it's not this nebulous thing it's Mm. very specific it's after some very specific things yeah and uncovering that for myself in a very rigorous way allowed me to be able to kind of piece it together for other people and say Here's what you need to look out for. Here's, mm. what, here's what you need to start getting your eye on. And if you get your eye on this, it'll reveal a lot. And so that's, that's very much been, I feel as if the work I've done on myself um, has been absolutely fundamental to my ability to reach into the background of other people's lives sure. and, and connect with their humanity in a way that, that makes a difference for them. Well, for people that aren't familiar with your story. What was that like? Like, what was your 
life or, or the way you think yeah. like, you know, when, back in the day? I mean, I was like everybody else. I was, you know, overcoming circumstances. Sure. I was trying to make money. I was trying to get along with people. I was trying to relax. I was had my worries about the future. I, had, I was, like most people, living in the pretense that my past wasn't impacting me anymore, mm. right? But when you actually do that work, you see that it's heavily impacting you. It's reaching into your present in the present moment and guiding you. Yeah. But, you know, I was... I was in, I had a small construction company. I was married. I had a son. You know, I was gripped by the same stuff that everybody else is gripped by. There was nothing remarkable going on. You know, it wasn't, you Just know. like an average no, Joe. I, like I, really, like, really. Um, small business Not owner. that I'm not an average Joe now, but I'm just, I, I like to think I'm just a little more informed. Sure. Um, about myself. But it was, um, but I was eager. I was eager to understand, you know. I was eager to kind of, not in a, self-serving way i was just more interested in understanding initially how i work but how do people work like what mm. is it why do we do great things and then kill it off you know why do we have brilliant ideas and then talk ourselves out of it sure why is it in certain relationships we we do the same stuff like even though we know this isn't going to be good it's like we're saying to ourselves oh, no, i can't say this and then out it comes you know mm. so why does my life go the way that it goes? All of that fascinated me, and, and that kind of grew into this, what I've started to call, you know, this kind of urban philosophy. It's a way of real-life answers for people to live sure. their life in, in, in new and expanded ways. Mm. Was there a particular event that really triggered you to to go on this path, or is it just been something that you've been thinking about as you were living your life and um, just kind of developed over time? Yeah, I, th I think the first concern was that I need to get my life together. You know, that was like, I mean, I was in my late 30s at the time. I'd been a musician for a number of years. I'd been... I'd owned a construction company for a number of years too, and this is in Scotland, right? No, no, this is all in the United oh, States. This is in the US? Yeah, okay, okay. yeah. I left Scotland and when I was in my mid twenties, mm. um, and so I was really—I mean, if, if anything—I was looking for an angle for myself, like how to kind of free myself up to continue to live the life that I'd built for myself. I had no sense that I was going to reinvent myself, you know? Yeah. It wasn't on my radar. It was like, how can I make more money? How can I be a bit happier? Maybe a little bit fitter. Maybe, you know, get along better with my wife. Go on nicer vacations. I was, I was looking for an angle. Yeah. What I wasn't expecting was this Pandora's box, you know? Like, it opened up and it put me... One of the things that I noticed is that the more I got myself together, the more it was impossible for me to pretend that the people in my life were okay. Mm. You I just had more awareness. It was like, I can't sit here slowly getting myself together knowing what you're going through or suspecting what you're going through. So, as and this is part of the problem with personal growth is you you're compelled to make a difference for others you're compelled to do it you can't because if you take away all the survival for a human being and you take away all the nonsense that we get caught up in you, we want to make life better for all of us mm. you know we do and some people pretend that they don't, you know, but ultimately we do. We want to make, even if it's just to the level of I want to make a difference for my mom and I want to make a difference for my dad or my family or my, we want to make a difference with people. Um, and it's important to us as human beings. I really fundamentally believe that. Like we're drawn to impact each other. Um, but because of the kind of survival element that also includes, well, but if you're going to get in my way, then, you know, I got it kill you off in one way or another. You know? Right. So um, it, it, there came a point, I think it was, this was about 10 years ago when I just surrendered my life to it. Like I'm, everything I'm doing now is to make a difference for others. Mm. And, and it really, there was no ulterior motive. There was no like, and then I'll, you know, there was none of that. It was, I'm here to make a difference. That's it. 
I'm just here to impact other people's lives. Yeah. In a in a way that frees them up. To do something like that, you have to get you out of the way first. That's you can't have too much of you in it. It has to be most people, you know, I still get people asking me, why don't you talk more about yourself? Because it's not about me. Then 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 I would be doing this for me. That's all ego. I don't I'm not interested in that. Yeah. I'm interested in getting me out of the way so that I can make a difference for you. I mean, if somebody asks me something of me, I'll I'll answer the question. But in that regard, I don't relate to this kind of ball of wax is fascinating in any way. Sure. I, I really it really is a life of service, you know, like to, to impact the lives of the people that are you're around. Yep. Yep. I mean I think tying you into the story certainly helps make people relate more to mm -hmm. to that story because I know uh, you know you can hear one message and it could be the same message but if you can relate to it a little bit more it kind of hits people's yeah. hearts a little bit more and yeah. it, and it can help make that change and I think it's pretty impressive how you've been able to you know this podcast is called Growth Minds and we talk a lot about you know fixed mindset versus growth mindset and I think a lot of people when they hit 25 or 30 they just yeah. get into a certain pattern of living a certain lifestyle yeah. or a certain way of thinking whether it's like their lifestyle or the people that they hang around with. And it's very hard for people to have that shift, yeah. especially later in life. Um, it's, and it's very unique for someone yeah. like yourself to have that at a, at a I, late 30s. You know, I think um, if, you, if, you, if you think about human beings, like what we're supposed to do, and, and if you think about like the first 25 years of your life, in my view, you're just working out what your struggle's going to be that first yep. 25 years. Yeah. The rest of your life is about having it. Because if you prod a human being when they're in their late 20s and their 30s and their 40s, and you'll say, what do you not like about your, the, your life? And they'll tell you. They'll say, I don't like this and I don't like that and this isn't. I'm unsatisfied with this. And then you say, well, you should just change that. Mm. They'll actually make a compelling case as to why they shouldn't. Just in their own heads. They'll and, just say, like, yeah. oh, well, I can't because it did, 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 did that, right? And, and, it, and it, I'm, I'm absolutely convinced that human beings are more interested in the race than the win. Hmm. They'd much rather just keep running than to face the horror of crossing the finish line. Because if your dreams came true, what would you do? <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> like, we always where do you chase. go, you know, and, and, you know, I was talking to you a little bit, but when I was a musician, I remember playing the Whiskey A Go-Go, which was a big thing for me back in, you know, when I was better looking, mm. um, <laughs> I had, had to, yeah, playing the Whiskey was like everything for me, you know, it was yeah. like, it was, a, it was like a dream come true. And I remember playing there and we headlined and we blew the doors off and it was awesome, you know, it was amazing. And uh, I remember after, like, everybody's like, all right, we're all going to go out and we're all going to party and we're all going to have a great time. And I went back to my dingy little motel room that night and went to my bed. And I was confronted. It was like an, it was like an existential crisis. It was like, what do I do now? Right. I played the whiskey. That was my dream. And I did it. And what do you do now? And if you look in your life, you'll see you've had some of those moments. Like you've accomplished the thing and, and you're immediately panicked to find the next thing, to drive on to the next thing. Like that's going to be the answer. Yeah. And then you find out that it's not. So I'm, I use myself obviously as an example, but all the people that I've coached and developed over the years, people would rather be miserable than deal with what they need to deal with to be mm. happy. Yeah, I mean, this is why like people that have achieved enormous things, like the initial astronauts that went to went to moon, they come back and it's been this hype that they've trained for and they've built up in their heads, and it's really the the pinnacle of what humanity has set out to do. So you accomplish that at its highest level, and you come back to Earth, and a lot of those guys are depressed. Of course, absolutely. I mean, just I mean, look, we're in we're in L.A., right? Like. The music industry here, the entertainment industry here is massive. Look at the number of people who have accomplished like brilliant things and then trashed their lives. Mm. Trashed them. Like just went for like, why? Because they because at some level they must need to get it down a few notches 
to get back in the grind again. Yeah. To try and come back. I mean, it was. I, I had this experience myself. Like, so with my first book, when it had sold a million copies, wow. and I confronted the idea of like what that now meant to me financially. And it was strange, like, because I'd spent my whole life with that money would be always be a struggle for me. Hmm. Now it was no longer a struggle. It was like, oh, what am I doing? You know, like, you can't just lie around in the sofa eating bonbons. You know, you got, life's got to be about something. And it was really like, it was probably one of the biggest challenges in my life was being successful. Not becoming successful was learning to exist as successful. When I say successful, I mean in that particular thing. Yeah. It, it was really like, what the heck? You know, like, what do I, how do I even, you know, where do, where do I turn to for my fuel? What's going to fuel me? Yeah. And, and, it, and then I noticed initially, by the way, at the beginning, that I was coming up with all these compelling reasons and things that I should spend the money on until I caught myself trying to make myself poor again. Like I was strategizing yeah. a way to empty the bank account because I couldn't exist with it. It's not like I couldn't exist with it. Who I had become couldn't exist with it. So that was another big transformation for me was learning to be okay with all of that and just let it all go and focus on what what I'm passionate about. For sure, yeah. yeah. I, mean, I, think, I think a lot of people, I mean, I think a lot of people are listening that are successful, but I think everyone is kind of kind of go from zero to one at this point, right? Yeah. Like they're, they're early in their careers or they're trying to strive for something. And it kind of goes back to this like Maslow's hierarchy of needs is like we have these fundamental things that we strive for. So until we get these basic needs, whether it's money, whether it's food, yeah. we don't really think about this idea of like self-actualization, which is way at the top of the pyramid. So when success hits you, whether it's a couple of years from now, you just haven't had that mental training. So when you hit it, you're like, oh shit, like I've never even thought about this. You're like, who <laughs> yeah. thinks like, oh, I have ten yeah, it's like, a, it's like a mental exercise. Some people do for fun, but you don't actually think about, you know, what's going to happen when you actually have those zeros in your bank yeah. account or, or whatever it is you that you have. I'll tell you the big problem because I talk about this in depth actually in my second book. Um, Try on the idea that whatever you've got in front of you, whatever the finish line is in your mind. So if you're watching or listening to this right now and you're thinking, well, it's a million dollars or six million dollars or doubling or tripling my income or whatever the thing is. Try on the idea that what you're actually out to do is overcome something about yourself mm. that this thing is going to take care of. So when I hit the target, it'll take care of this problem, this kind of deep-seated problem that I have with myself. Sure. And this is why people get messed up, because they get there, and it's still you. You're not any different. Yeah. And people think, no, no, I'll be more confident, or I'll be more that. Now, it's, a, it's the, the fundamental problem that you are for yourself is still intact. And that's why I say to people, play the money game, play the accolade game, play all that stuff, do it, you know, you know, shake a stick at it, have, have a blast doing it. But you should be working on yourself the whole time. Because the worst thing, and it really is like a horrible thing that can happen to a human being, is to invest everything they have into something, some outcome, that when they get there, the, the floor falls out from underneath their feet. You want to be able to get there and use it as a launching pad for the next self-expression, but not like chasing something, more like daily fulfilling on something, which is a very different phenomenon. Most people live what they would call, you know, their purpose or whatever, like there's a day when it turns out. The future's really only there to inform the present. It's not there to be gotten to mm. it's 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 like you know i i i became a writer because of what it brings to my life today 
I didn't become a writer to sell a million or two million books. That wasn't like, oh, yeah, and when I get to two million books, then it'll be all amazing. No, it's like, oh, I, I get to live my life as a writer. Or I get to live my life as an entrepreneur. Or I get to live my life as an investor. I get to, like, the future informs you. It, it fulfills the life you have. And the more you can do that, the more you can catch yourself, like, chasing the black hole of the future. The more you can kind of bring yourself into the present and having that be something that inspires you and calls you to take actions, actually, the more you'll love the whole process of, of your journey. Yeah, I, I, I personally struggle with this. I mean, the, the devil's advocate to that is, I think some people would argue that the people that achieve greatness yeah. from society standards, yeah. maybe not internally. Yeah. You look at the Michael Jordans of the world, and he's a great example where yeah. he got announced as the Hall of Fame uh, and he was giving his speech, greatest basketball of all time. And the first thing that he points out is writers talking shit about him when he was in his early 20s. Right. And it's like the first thing. So it's it's still in his mind. And, he, and it seems like he lives with this fuel of a little bit of, I don't know, but I don't know if it's like hate, but it's needing to constantly prove something yeah. to to the public and to himself. And I don't know if he's fully fulfilled, but I think it's what makes him great. Yeah. I'll I'll say this, um, because I've I've actually coached a number of athletes, right? Like professional athletes. <clears throat> Whatever makes you great and the thing that may that you're that you're focused on will be your undoing in the other areas of your life. Mm. Right? It's very challenging to be, com to be independent and competitive and in love. Yeah. Very challenging. So, in other words, your strength, while your strength, will undermine other parts of your, your life if you're not paying attention. Because most human beings, unless they're, again, do the work on themselves, they can't shift gears. They're driven to be that way. They're, like, compelled to be that way. And they'll say stuff like, well, it's all worth the sacrifice, and, that, 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 that. and I say, yeah, fine, but it's unnecessary. Mm. You can develop yourself. You can develop yourself to be... And I'm sure people like Michael Jordan had other influences around them to keep that sense of wholeness. Because... That drivenness, that kind of, people call it single-mindedness. To me, it's a little more myopic. Mm. It's more like you're missing out on the opportunity that it is to be alive. You can do it all. You can have it all. You can accomplish great things in your life. And you can have it all. Sure. People think it's all sacrifice. Sometimes it is. A lot of times it's not. You know, a lot of times it's not. But I would say... um, I would say if you keep living your life with the, that the future is somehow going to be the answer to the life you have, that's, that's, I don't fancy your chances. Yeah. Really don't. I, I think you got to start getting, and this is how I live my life. I live my life with the ending in mind. And I mean like the ending. I don't mean like next week. I mean like the ending. Right. I'm informed by the ending. What do I want to be left with at the end? At the end of this life, I want to be left with that my life made a difference. That gets me out of bed. It gets me interacting with life in a very distinct and a very unique way. Mm. It's, it brings me out of all my, you know, emotional concerns, my usual circumstantial concerns. I'm, I'm, I'm compelled to act when faced with that future. I'm not in a hurry to get to it, though. You know, mm. like I'm not in a hurry for the end. Like I have financial goals, for instance. My financial goals just tell me what to do today. It's not, it's not even about getting there. It's, you know, I check in, like, how am I doing, you know? Um, but to me, it's not about the goal. It's about what that does to my life now. Yeah. Like, how does it change? Like I say to people, uh, if you look in your life right now, and this is just in any area of life, but look, you see you're currently out to solve certain problems, be they financial, physical, you know, whatever. You're, and you're working on solving these problems in your life. You're, I'm at work on this and I'm at work on that. 
And I say, where did you come up with those as problems, though? Mm. Like, where yeah. did you start? You know, and, and I noticed, like, that I was out to solve for a, a long time in my life the problem of $100,000 a year. It, it took everything that I had to produce that. Yeah. And then it was much, much later I, th I thought, why didn't I just make that half a million? Hmm. And I'll tell you why I didn't make half a million, because I didn't think I could. I didn't think it was possible for me. So I, I would have said at that time, though, when I was out to meet that $100,000, I was entrepreneurial, I was going for it, I was playing a big game. But you, it's very challenging to see the trap you're setting for yourself. See, and sometimes people can be very positive, so they get very enthusiastic. Oh, yeah, I'm going to make 20 million this year or something, you know? Yeah. And I've only ever made 20 grand. Um, there's nothing wrong with making 20,000, but still, you got to kind of get your, your focus in the right direction. But people are always functioning in some kind of reality that they don't really have the sense that they made it. It feels like I'm born into the world. Mm. It doesn't feel like I'm existing completely and entirely in my view of the world. It seems like I'm existing in the world. Yeah. But I'm constrained by what I think of it and what's possible in it until, again, I do the work. I start, uh, you often hear this from people, they talk about self-limiting beliefs. You don't know your own. Why? Because you believe them. Mm. You can sometimes see other people's self-limiting beliefs. Like, oh, yeah, that's just a self-limiting belief. Yours are the truth. You, be you, you believe them to your bones. You've got evidence. You have, if somebody challenges you, but I mean, I'm like, no, 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 no. Let me tell you what I've learned, you know. And <clears throat> you're constantly, even when you break out of a box, you've only just put yourself in another one. And that's the interesting thing to me. It's about exploring. Yeah, where have I put myself now? Nah. Right. So right. Ra raising what's, your standards. What's available? What else is out here? How, what about over here? And then all of that, that kind of approach demands that you reinvent yourself. It demands it of you. You can't be the you that you've become and do the things that you dream about. Sure. You have to start stepping into that next you. Right. And that's when the future is informing you and it's demanding of you and you don't know what to do and you're confronted and you're confused and should I and shouldn't I? Yeah, that's the future calling. Right. Yeah, I mean, speaking to, I mean, we can keep this in like a, let's say the financial terms. How do you, how do you balance it? Because it, it seems like, it seems like raising your standards is, is certainly important so that you don't have these self-limiting beliefs. So you're, you talk about $100,000, right. you, you believe that that was like the goal that you had internally, so you right. reach it and you feel like, why didn't you just set a higher goal and, right. and have a higher standard? How do you balance that where, let's say you really decide to raise your standards and you go for 10 million, it just feels so far away for people that they just uh, yeah. don't have that belief in themselves or, or it kind of discourages right. themselves. So how do, you, how do you balance those two? I think that's a brilliant place to look though. It's like you're now confronting something. Hmm. You're like, holy crap, I actually don't think that's possible for me. And that's the first thing you're confronting. Like, I actually don't think that's possible for me. I think other people have done it. Yeah. And what you'll see is how addicted or attached you are to the little bubble that you built for yourself. You're actually really attached to it. You're like, oh, most people, when you say to them, double your income, for instance, I'll give you an example. I'll use a finance as an example, if yeah. you say to somebody double their income, the first thing they think of is doing more of what they've done before. So they're going to double down on their actions. Or they'll come up with some harebrained side hustle. Yeah. Right. Oh, I swear I've got an app. I'm going to do it. <laughs> right. <laughs> or whatever my thing might be. And there's nothing, again, nothing wrong with apps, but, but there'll be some side hustle. So it's either double down on what you know or some leap of fantasy. Mm. People don't consider, hold on a minute, I, I need to reinvent everything. I can't do what I'm doing and produce that. So what do I do? Then I would look at, well, people that are making $10 million, what are they doing? What are they doing that I'm not doing? And then I would start asking myself, and, I, and you know, I've actually done this 
and produce the numbers associated with it. So I know that this is something that, that works. Yeah. You need to ask yourself, is what I'm about to do consistent with this thing over here or that thing over there? And you'll notice most of your day is consistent with this thing over here. It's most of your day you're perpetuating the life you have. And if you're saying, well, $10 million, how many $10 million actions are you taking every day? Really, like tell yourself the truth. Not like, well, I hope this turns out. No, I mean like look in your life. What are you doing today that's consistent with $10 million? Now, again, I get when you start to talk about big numbers like that, people get all messed up. They get all like, you know, like, oh, 10 million, because they can't even like confront the reality of that. Sure. You know, it's like, a, it's like a crazy number of dollars for, for most people, right? I, that, I mean, we're in California, so there's a number of people here, like that's not a lot of money for them. But, but that's what you're up against. You're not up against $10 million. You're up against what you think about that. That's the battle. The battle's not how do I make it. The battle is how can I recognize this kind of paradigm that I've put myself in and see it for what it is. Mm. Like the question I love to ask people is, do you think it's harder to make $10 million or minimum wage? Which one's the harder life? I imagine... I mean, I think most people would want the 10 million, but I think most people would think the minimum wage life is, is harder. It, and it is. Yeah. That's a hard life, man. And it's not easy to kind of just, oh, let me just snap myself out of this with this, listen to this Scottish guy. I should go get a couple of his bucks and then I'll be good to go with my 10 million bucks. Yeah. No, it really takes something to reinvent yourself. But at the same time, and, and, I, and I know this because I've done it. Right. I mean, you know, when when I was a musician, I think if I made a hundred bucks a week, it was a great week. Um, lot of noodles <laughs> yeah. in that time in my life. Yeah. But all my energy was going towards that hundred bucks. Everything that I had was about that hundred bucks. My, you know, it was hours and 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 hours, and hours to get that hundred bucks. It wasn't until much later, like I'd said, well, what if I just spent those hours on something else? Maybe I'd have made 200 yeah. or 400. It's, it's, it's not an easy thing to do, but what I invite people to understand is those paradigms, those other worlds are available to you. They're not unavailable. They're available. Are they easy? No. They're unbelievably challenging. You have to turn yourself inside out. You have to reinvent yourself. You have to burn down whatever empire you've built for yourself and then build another one, then burn that down. And then all of that's upsetting, uncertain, sometimes chaotic. Yeah. But that's what it takes. It takes that kind of approach where you're exposing yourself to the risk of undoing the life you've built to create something new, to create another phenomenon for yourself, if you like. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. I, th I think the word reinvention is, is really key, where I, th I think it certainly starts with reinventing your thinking, and that will help you reinvent whatever it is that you're currently doing. Because as you mentioned, a lot of people just shoot for 10% increase, right. or 50% increase, yeah. maximum, double, 100% right. increase. But if you really, at least from... Personal experience and just people that I've interviewed, I think the fundamental shift, if they want that, if they want to completely reinvent, is you have to think 10x. And in, in order to do that, as you mentioned, you, you kind of have to burn whatever you're, is, is that you're doing, because whatever action you're taking, whatever tasks you have, because it does require something completely different. Search and find that and what's next and what's available until I'd gotten to like 30,000 copies of that book as a self-published book. And I was like, no, nope, that's not it. What's next? Like it was never, it was, it was always looking to the future and asking it to inform me, like, where, where's my next turn? What do I do with this thing? And people might say, well, I mean, because it was a, if I look back in that time, I was just run off my feet, you know, like the hours of sleep weren't too many back then, for sure. But it was amazing. Like I was getting to live this life. I yeah. was, 
up to something. You know, it was like it was, I was, I didn't want to sleep. I wanted to get to work. You know, I wanted to write and talk to people. And, you know, I was so inspired by it. Mm. Cause, and I was, I, like I said, that it was a new paradigm for me, a new world for me. I was exploring it. I was like, oh, here. And that's part of the trick with this is sometimes when you do have like whatever success you have, that survival thing kicks in where you try and keep it mm. and maintain it or repeat it. And you don't realize that what got you there was putting yourself at risk for it. Yeah, it's so true. That's what got you into it. You, so were, you were exposed. You were vulnerable. And you were like, you know what? And people think that's got something to do with youth. It's, it's not. I, I, I disagree with that. I actually think it's that, that element of risk, that openness to risk. You'll see it in people much, much later in life. You'll see people doing it all the time. Hmm. You know, like... People don't realize, like, if you re if you live in Chicago or New York City and you retire to Florida and you've lived in Chicago for 65 years, that's a big risk right there. You know, like, that's not... But people are... They tend to measure the risks. They try and base them on things. The greatest things you ever did in your life when you were exposed, when, when there was the threat of failure, but you didn't care. You were all in with the thing itself sure uh you know i'm 53 now and i i i'll live that way till i die i'm not interested in securing what i've built or some nonsense like that i'm interested in what else is available what else is out there for me as a human being what's yeah. what what's what's the what what's left in this world that i can explore and discover for myself yeah um because that ultimately to me it's why you're here. You're here to burn through this carcass <laughs> and, and to give this all you got, you know. And it's not about strategizing your life, you know. And, and you should have strategies. Yeah. But you can't strategize your life. You got you to gotta play full out, throw yourself into it. Yeah, I, th I think just constantly... I mean, people think of stress as a as a as a bad thing, and it can be obviously at a certain yeah. kill, at a certain level. But you do need to be. I mean, that's really at the fundamental biological level. Our, our cells. I mean, people say that when you're when you're fasting, right? Well, your 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 cells are put under so much stress. But what? Because it's just it's so used to getting food in yeah. your system. But what happens at a certain stage? It just adapts. Yeah, right? and it produces regenerative cells. That's right. It's literally the way our, our, our biology, like bodies, work, and but we just don't apply that in our regular. No, life, I mean, know? look, I'll I'll tell you, look, there's it never ceases to amaze me that people get up to best, big things and then get surprised when they're stressed. Yeah. I like you know, if you go into the coffee shop, what does it smell like? I mean, you never walk into the coffee shop and you're like, oh wow, it smells like coffee in here. That's <laughs> That's a, I'm just, you know, <laughs> yeah. and there's no time you ever go in there and it smells like an oil refinery or something. It always smells like coffee, you know? Well, if you're up to big games in life, it smells like stress. Mm. So then if it smells like stress, what are you doing with that? What are you, are you just like, oh my gosh, one of these days? Or are you including it in your life? Like, okay, this is my experience of myself right now. And by the way, stress is an experience. It's not a condition. Mm. Sometimes people treat it like it's a disease or something. It's an experience you're having. All right, well, what can you add to your life or take away from your life that would support you in handling it? You're not going to make it go away. Why? You're up to big things. Yeah. Human beings, when they're exposed to the unknown, yeah, they get a little wired or sometimes a lot wired, you know, like really charged. Um, it's part of the deal. And it's sure. one of the things that I've, I've learned to do. I, I spent a lot of years of my life trying to make certain experiences of myself go away, hmm. trying to make them disappear, you know, like being anxious or suppressed or worried or, you know, whatever my thing might be. What I've started to realize is that's not the point. The point isn't to make that to go away. The point is to discover for myself how to live while that's there. And if I can live while that's there, the impact of that gets less and less and less in my life. 
So I'm not out to change my experience of being alive. I'm fascinated by what else I can do, given that that's there. Hmm. I'm not, I'm not, I really have no, like I'm okay with being, you know, frustrated, angry, like I said, suppressed, anxious, worried. That's all fine. It's part of the human experience. I mean, I'm not going to set up camp there or something, you know, it's not a good place to hang out all the time. But I'm okay with those experiences of myself. They're, sure. they're not, I'm not in any hurry to change any of that. I'm, I, I wrote, and I know this goes against the grain. Some of the greatest things I did in my life, I did it with a negative mindset. I included it. I knew the mindset was there. Like, I didn't want to do it. I can't do it. It's too much. I'm not smart enough. It was all there. And I was able to still function. Mm. So it was like, rather than how do I get that to suppress and go away? And here's what you notice. If you can bring yourself to act, that is, take an action or actions, while that's there, that'll disappear. Because mm. you'll become so authentically engrossed in the action. It might take an hour. It might take a day. But you'll become so engrossed in it, all the noise will go away and you'll be caught up in the thing again. Mm. So if people have often got this upside down. They're like, oh, how do I get that done? How do I deal with this? And da, 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 da. When really you just need to turn your attention to what it is you're passionate about, what you really love to do. Sure. And you'll get engrossed in it. Your brain will get so wrapped up in it, all that noise will be gone. And then it'll be back. You know? yeah. It's coming back again. Yeah. It's okay. It's not a problem until you make it one. It's not a problem until it's driving you. And then, but that's a process you can learn and you can teach yourself how to intervene with that, how to step in there, even just little things. Oh, well, typically I would do this, but today I did this. Typically I would do that, and today I did that. Like you're in those little moments, you're rerouting yourself away from your typical behaviors that would normally take you down a very predictable path. You're rerouting yourself away. Sure. I, you know, my big thing with people is you're not broken. There's nothing wrong with you. It's like you're an expression and you have an opportunity to go out there and express and, and you'll have to do it sometimes in the presence of, I don't want to, you'll have to do it. Yeah. But that's when you start to become masterful with your own wiring and your own conditioning. You start to become someone who can intervene with that. Mm. And there's a German philosopher, Martin Heidegger, said, freedom for a human... I'm going to paraphrase here, of course. He said it a lot more eloquently than I could say. <laughs> but he said, freedom for a human being can be found in the actions you take when confronted by your default self. So that is the things you do when compelled to be your old self. That's freedom. Mm. It's like you struck a blow for something. It's pretty elegant. <laughs> Even though it's paraphrased, <laughs> right. it's, it's pretty yeah, I'm eloquent. I'm sure he's, he was, you know, he said it in German, which probably sounds a lot more imposing. Yeah, it's a but, Scottish accent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, you can't help but be imposing when you're German. Yeah. But, but what he's saying is, it's not, therefore the struggle is not to change how I feel but rather to change how I act when in the presence of how I feel. Mm. Now, that's a practice. That's like, a, that's an arm when I practice. Like, and I did this with my first book. I said I didn't want to write a book. I really didn't feel as if I could do it. I didn't think it was, I, could, I could actually write a book. But every day I made a promise I'm going to write. So I would get in front of the laptop. And some days I just hated it. Like, I can't do it. And so what I would type was, I can't do it. You know, I would type my thoughts <laughs> onto the page. But I would notice, after a while, I would type something else, and then I would kind of get caught up in, oh, yeah, that was very good. And then so all the thoughts that I can't were gone. They can't coexist in my brain when I'm authentically engaged in something else. Now. Sure. So it was, a, it was a brilliant exercise in producing triumph, when faced by my darkest self, if you like. Yeah. Yeah. Have you heard of uh, Rich Roll by any chance? No. He's, um, I think he's in his early 50s, and he's like now a major triathlete. Yeah. But he faced um, alcoholism yeah. throughout his early 
30s, I think all the way up to his 40s. And he's, he's now like a book, uh, you know, podcast and everything. And he talks a lot about this. We had him on the podcast. Very similar message to you where the, 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 this is like his default thinking. And he actually overcame alcoholism through this way of thinking, which is whenever he would want uh, a glass of vodka or a glass right. of scotch, his state of mind was sitting on a couch or he was depressed or he had a certain state of being. Yeah. So the way he shifted from that was he would go to the gym and he would be in a completely different state. He would be more energetic. He would feel this healthy vibe. And then he would ask himself and th that thought he wouldn't even come. Right. By the time. So, he, so his, his advice of how he overcame alcoholism and how he would give advice to other people for anything in their lives to do is to change your state first. Let's change the way you feel first, whether it's moving around, whether it's going for an exercise or whether it's taking action, as you say. Yeah. I think you have a very powerful thought where you say you're not, you're not your thoughts. You are what you do. Correct. And I'm not the first person to say that. Mm -hmm. That's been, that's been said for, a, you know, since at least since the great stoic philosophers. Sure. Yeah. Um, who have said, you know, if you want to find out basically what's at the heart of a human being, watch them. Don't listen to them. Watch what they're doing. Mm. And and in, in you engage. I mean, this is hard initially to get your head around. Life only ever changes in the paradigm of action. Most people think if I change, if I focus on just changing how I feel as I'm sitting in a chair looking at Netflix that'll somehow compel me to act differently. No. You have to act differently. And this, this, if you listen to what uh, this gentleman you were talking about, he would go to the gym. I guarantee you every time you went to the gym, there were plenty of times when he just didn't feel like going. But he went. And that's interesting. People think, well, let's get something to do with willpower. I mean, you know, define willpower for me then. Tell me what willpower is. Here's what you'll, people who demonstrate that kind of stuff do it in the absence of willpower. Hmm. Do it in the absence of courage. Do it in the absence of these things. And it's almost like they really do. They myopically take the actions that are consistent with the life they want when faced with the feelings of the life they have. So I'm taking the actions that are consistent with the life that I want, but I'm present to the feelings that are consistent with the life that I have. And that's the initial struggle. That's the initial confront for you as a human being. It's like, oh, this life I want, I'd need to be doing this and this and this and this and this. Too many people though are trying to work out how they could get themselves ready for that rather than just go do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I <laughs> you, struggle with it, yeah. You know, and, and I get it. I, you know, and you know yeah. what? I did too because I looked at life in the same way that everybody else does. Like if I fix this, then everything going on around me will be fine. What I've come to realize, what I've discovered through reading and learning and coaching people and helping people, if you get out there and you take the – I mean, I coached um, – I've coached some like really – you know, very accomplished sports people. And they came to me, one of them came to me looking for confidence, for instance. Right? They said, I want confidence. I'm, I feel as if I've lost my confidence. And you got to get the insanity of that statement. Like you can have it. What do you mean? Ha you don't have confidence. It's an experience that passes through you. It comes and goes. However, if you want to actually get it, if you want to actually have the experience of confidence... You'll have to do the thing you want to do with no confidence. And then the confidence will come up. So with this person, I said, the confidence will arise after you hit the shot. Mm. And they were like, well, but I don't have the confidence to hit the shot. I said, you don't need the confidence to hit the shot. You need the mechanics to hit the shot. Go work in your mechanics. If you're doing 1,000 shots a day, do 2,000 or 3,000, whatever it is until it's down and then go hit the shot and then you'll notice the confidence arises yeah. and it does it like comes up confidence is what comes up in a human being it's an experience it's a very powerful experience by the way 
But it arises in the moments or the times after you've actually done the thing that you had no confidence with. Yeah. Life changes in the paradigm of action. You need to get into, and, and it's amazing, it's amazing what you're, what's available to you as a human being, like what's possible for you as a human being. That you can accomplish great things without feeling like you can't. Like you don't, you don't have to feel like you're ready to be ready, mm. you know? You don't have to feel, and you know, the Stoics said this, you know, to be courageous, one must act courageously. They don't say to be courageous, get the feelings going first. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I yeah, mean? Yeah. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, I'm feeling the courage. Let's go. Yeah. No, it's like you step out into the unknown and then you realize, wow, I'm equipped. And that's the this is what I love about people. People are equipped for the unknown. Sure. They're already equipped for it. How do you know? You're alive. Yeah. You're already existing in it. But you're grabbing for things to try and make it known, you know, or certain or something. Uh, human beings, in my view, are mostly operating at somewhere like 20 or 30% of capacity. Even the most pushed ones, the most stressed ones, you're about 30% mm. of capacity. You're a, you're a bottomless well of being. You have an un, unlimited capacity for passion, love, adventure. Like, it's all there. But you need to first get out of the way, whatever might be in the way of your express and all of that. Absolutely, yeah. I think one of my favorite things about your message is this idea of expect nothing and accept everything. And it's right. similar in line with like the stoicism philosophy, right. right? And I love it. I think Marcus Aurelius, and I'm going to paraphrase, not the, as eloquent as you have, <laughs> but he, uh, in meditations, I think he says something around, say to yourself every morning, that you're going to meet people that are going to be envious of you, people that are going to be jealous, people that are uh, evil. And it's like this idea of like, almost like being so, I don't know if it's like realistic, yeah. but it's just having this type of mindset where you're just going to accept everything that comes at you. Yeah. And you're not going to expect anything yeah. else from that. So, yeah. um, it's interesting, the whole notion of this. Because people will say stuff like, well, it is what it is, right? But you have no sense of what is. When someone says it is what it is, what they're actually saying is, it is what I think it is. Mm. They're not saying it is what it is. Because if you actually relate it to everything as it is, nothing's offensive. Because yeah. it's just what that is. Yeah. Like, that person spoke. That's what that is. Yeah. When they say, well, that was offensive and that is what it is. No, that's not what it is. <laughs> now I'm confused. <laughs> so what, what I'm pointing to when people say, well, things just are the way they are, for instance. No, they are the way you see that they are. Which is tainted. Yeah. Which is biased. Yeah. And what you're doing is bringing some kind of sense of positivity or just kind of being a little bit philosophical about it without actually getting. There's nothing around you that has any significance. I mean, if you look at like Zen Buddhism, for instance, the whole point of that is for you to get. There's no significance, not even in you. Mm. Your upsets are insignificant. Yeah. Your challenges are insignificant. <laughs> What makes them significant is you. But on their own, there's no significance to this paper cup. But somebody could make that a big deal. Like they get annoyed by paper cups. Or and we've got significance around the paper cup, right? Yeah, yeah, but there yeah. is no, on its own, there's no significance to the cup. So it's interesting that um, I, I think a lot of, personal growth work is building strategies to overcome you or have you be a better you. Everything that I do is about you finally understanding you, setting it aside, and exploring. 
mm. that you notice you and set you aside. Most of what you'll read out there is about somehow shaping this to be better at what it does. I'm not interested in that. You've already, you're at the zenith of, of this. You're at the zenith of this. There's no, you can only do a better version of this. That's your limit. A reinvention is when you can acknowledge all of that and see all of that and leave all of that where it is and step into the unknown hmm. and then notice the compulsion to be you. And that's why I say accept everything um, because that's a real choice. Like take, people think if I accept something, I'm stuck with it. No, I can accept something and change it. I just don't get all screwed up about changing it. I actually have real power to change it now because sure. – I accept that for what that is. People think I'm now, you know, somehow burdened by it. And so I accept everything. I accept it the way it is. I don't, I'm not interested in any emotional charge around that thing. It doesn't work for me. My blood pressure gets high. I'm Scottish. We get a little nutty. <laughs> yeah. um, and I, I don't expect anything. Like, if I say, you know, Happy birthday to you. I don't expect you to say thank you. I, I don't care. The point was for me to say happy birthday. Yeah. <laughs> you know, whatever you're going to do, whatever you're going to do with that. But usually I'm not like, oh, this son of a gun never even said <laughs> thank you. And I put it on his Facebook page and everything. Like, no, that's just like a petty upset. Yeah. You know, yeah. I'm, I'm really interested in interacting with the world in ways that empower me and empower people. Yeah, it's very backwards. I mean, to how most people are living today. I mean, you've got from social media, the follow for follow to like for like, you know, and you know, it's, it's, it's this idea of like give and, give and take all the time, which certainly matters, but I think if you expect it, right. is where the, where the downfall is. So it's a yeah, very powerful I don't, way. I mean, I, I mean, I, there are so many times where I can invoke Jean-Paul Sartre and his approach to meaninglessness the stuff that we give meaning and significance to, by the end of your life, you'll be shaking your head at the amount of time you wasted pursuing it. Mm. It's, and it's the want of a human being to do such a thing, you know, to like pursue whatever you've made significant. And I get it. But uh, the more you can recognize that you're doing this to yourself, the more freedom you'll have to intervene with yourself. Um, I'm, it's it's weird, you know, in, in many ways, because because we're in an environment where we're all trying to make it. Yeah. And how you make it is to give up the notion of making it. Well, I think that's a very powerful way to end this, Gary. <laughs> I know I could literally talk to you for hours, but I know you've got a, a flight to catch. That's right. So I do want to end uh, end this interview with a message to the people. We generally like to leave people with some actionable steps or at least one actionable step that they can take. It can be something super small uh, to, to an exercise that they can do, mental mental framework that they should think about, something that they can do at least in their day-to-day, -day, right after they listen to this so that they can start doing right. instead of being in their own thoughts. What's one piece of action that they can take? I think this is a really important thing for people. Uh, people live with a tremendous amount of I'm gonna's on their mind. Right? And they think that that has, is having very little impact on their ability to be effective. And I say to people, uh, take on one of those big I'm gone as you've got in your mind, whether it's like, I'm going to finish my taxes, I'm going to, whatever your thing might be, and you'll have something. It might be your garage, by the way, or your storage closet, or your, but something on your mind that you're like, I'm going to get to, I'm going to get to it. I say to people, get out your calendar, set out an hour or two hours or a day or two days in your calendar and get it put in there. This is when I'm going to handle this. Mm. Right? And it might be a week from now or two weeks from now or three weeks from now, but get it in there. And notice the difference immediately. You haven't even done anything but put it in your calendar. Like notice the difference it makes from you knowing that this thing is now in a state of being handled. You'll actually experience a sense of relief. If you actually do the thing, if you actually just turn around right after this and say, you know what, I'm just going to do it. Mm. The burden, 
your experience from handling what's on your mind, that's a process you got to start taking care of diligently. You got to start getting off your mind what's on your mind. Either got to get it in process or done. And if you start approaching your life in that way, you'll, your, your ability to be effective in the areas of life that really matter to you will go through the roof. I love it. I yeah. love it. Well, thank you so much. Where can people, uh, how can people connect with you? Yeah, I'm on Instagram a lot these days. It's probably one of my smallest social media outlets, but I just, I don't know, I'm on there a lot these days. I do videos and all kinds of stuff on Instagram, Gary John Bishop. But, uh, but you can also see me on Facebook, which I'm less and less on Facebook these yeah, days. Not, um, not many people are going to Facebook. No. I do little bits on Twitter too, um, but uh, you can catch up with me there. And then, you know, you'll find information about me on my website, garyjohnbishop.com and I'm committed that people get as many resources as they can for free. Yeah. So. Yeah. And definitely check out his that. books, guys. Yeah. Well, yeah, for sure. Buy a book. <laughs> you know. That's it. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you, guys. Stay tuned for next week. Thanks so much for tuning in. Awesome. Great. Yeah. yeah looking at the clock. <laughs> Where did we go up to? Oh, yeah. Well, guys hope you guys enjoyed this episode thanks so much for tuning in this episode was sponsored by shopify shopify is a commerce platform uh, from everything that you need from point of sales all the way to e-commerce whether you want to start grow or scale your business we're here at the shopify la office in row downtown la where they provide support for entrepreneurs seven days a week they also have live events with some of the top business leaders in the world and you guys if you guys want to learn more information book a photo shoot, or even book a podcast studio session, come check out la.shopify.com.